Hello, everybody. I, I, I'm very glad to, to be uh, in Tel Aviv again, uh, coming here regularly to see family, friends, working less, less often. Um, I think you, you should be congratulated. Uh, first of all, because you, you're going to, to listen to a speech right after lunch, which is always something of a challenge. Uh, and the second one, uh, for us, who come from Brussels and related places, uh, it's always a challenge to work when it's 24 degrees outside and it's beautiful and, and we are here and we have to discuss serious things. Anyway, um, I would like to, to start this uh, session with, uh, with a paradox. Israel is one of the most dynamic countries in, in the world on the economic front. It has growth rates that, despite not being in the uh, two-digit rate range, uh, are very enviable from uh, a European perspective. Israel is a blessed land for startups. It's a digital champion as recognized by the fact that uh, all Silicon Valley giants are all present in, in this country, in Herzliya and elsewhere. This is one picture of Israel. And there is another one. And the other one is synonymous with terrible political impasse. And the feeling is that there is no alternative, ein brecha, in Hebrew. A two-state resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is more distant than ever. Next year, it's going to be half a century since the Israeli occupation of the West Bank began. And when settlements started, when they were initiated, it was for, for security reasons, the Alon plan. With settlements occupying less than 5% of the territories. And that was what I would call settlements 1.0. And in 2005, there were already 250,000 settlers who lived in the occupied territories, including, excluding in, in East Jerusalem. And today, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> dear friends, you know that there are approximately 370,000 settlers. And the development of, of the settlements today is not anymore driven by security, but by other factors, <laughs> which include the fair complete policy, economic incentives to settlers, and religion-driven nationalism, and the incorporation of all the biblical land of Israel has advanced too far and for too long for us to be able to say, yes, it can be reserved, no. We are political foundation. We can say things. The Prime Minister in this country has already spent altogether more than 10 years in power. He feels comfortable with those developments as the continuous expansion of settlements demonstrate. And on the, on the Palestinian political front, things are far from being more exciting. Abu Mazen, and more generally the, 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 the Palestinian Authority, have lost the legitimacy, the cohesion, and the will to do much about that situation either. And when you look at the cancellation 
of the municipal elections which were supposed to take place in, in the West Bank and, and in Gaza uh, last month, I think that, that constitutes another sign of, of paralyzing uh, Palestinian infighting. And Abu Mazen is embroiled in, in, in the conflict within Fatah, is worried about Hamas, and is providing no direction. In the US, we see a departing administration which, uh, which has reached a point, reached a point of uh, acute exasperation. And let's be honest, we can understand. I can understand them. Israel announced last month a new West Bank settlement just weeks after the US concluded a 38 billion 10-year military aid package. Despite its exasperation, despite being provoked and even, I feel, insulted by an Israeli prime minister getting overtly involved in internal US politics, supporting the Republicans against the incumbent administration, it's nevertheless doubtful that either Hillary or Trump will be prepared to condition the US support to Israel to a change in Israel's position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And there is another dimension which I think is, is worth noting unfortunately. And that is the fact that the Palestinian question is more and more impacting Israel's internal policies and the quality of the Israeli democracy. The political and cultural drift is towards ever more intolerant nationalism. And we heard this morning the admirable words of Nachman Shai calling for Israel to accept refugees from Syria. And we know that Shai's views are far from being shared by the majority of his fellow citizens, and certainly not by, by the government. But is it normal, and again, we are talking between friends, is it normal that in a democracy, if you criticize the government, you run the risk of being considered as a traitor. Groups like Betselem, which focuses on allegations of, of human rights violations against Palestinians in the, in, the, in the territories, those groups are under violent attack. The messianic religious Zionism that holds all the West Bank to be Israel's, by biblical decrees, is ascendant. And it's even, at least that's how I see it, it's even gradually pervading Sahal up to higher and higher echelons. And I think this is very worrying. It is worrying because when you remember that since the creation of the state, the Israeli defense forces had, as it should be in a democracy, remained quite immune from politics from religion, and from the link between both. And we know that on the left, for the moment, things are very difficult. And that's an, an understatement. So against that background, against the background of such a gloomy picture, what is the way forward? Is there a way forward? The two-state solution is becoming, for many people, people say it's a charade. But is a one <coughs> binational state solution more feasible? And if so, would it be sustainable? You know very well, and we tend to forget it very often in Europe, that there are altogether 4.1 million Arabs under one or another form of Israeli administration. 1.5 million citizens of Israel, that is 17% of the, of the total Israeli population of 8.5 million, and 2.6 million uh, in the West Bank. And therefore, in a binational state, 
Arabs would represent at least 60% of the population from the very beginning, just from the very beginning with today's figures. And due to different demographics, it would be an even larger percentage as time goes by. Already today, a friend was telling me this morning, if the East Jerusalem-based uh, Palestinians would use their voting rights, which fortunately they refused to do, Jerusalem would have a Palestinian mayor. So how could a binational state remain Jewish without giving up its democratic DNA? Would it be through apartheid, which is so alien to Jewish ethics and values? If that becomes the rule, how viable could in the medium run, and I think that when I say medium run, I'm not, I don't have in mind a very large number of years, how could in the medium run that binational states be viable? For me, it could not. So what does it mean? Committing suicide? So again, because I want to provide some openings, what's the way forward to get things moving? Yes, Brera, there is an alternative. And let me suggest some of its components in, in the forms of, of four recommendations briefly. Today, the Palestinians suffer from Israeli humiliations, big and small. And this has got nothing to do with security. Security is a fact. Security is something that you don't talk about, you don't negotiate. I'm not, I'm not talking about asserting the security needs of, of Israel and of its people. But I think, having in mind the background of those, the situation on the ground, the first feasible move Israel could do is to ease those humiliations and economic hardship for Palestinians in the territories. Again, without compromising the uh, security. I'm thinking of, for instance, taking down some roadblocks, making easier some formalities for, for movement in and out of Gaza, and possibly granting more building permits in the West Bank. And why not? Even you don't do it as a big political, with, with a lot of publicity, stop or slow down settlement expansion. My second recommendation calls for the US to reconsider their unconditional support to Israel, and as such, the use of the veto in the UN Security Council. The success of, of, in the US of progressive groups within the Jewish community, such as J Street, show that such a shift in US policy would not necessarily anymore be electorally suicidal for the US political leadership. The third recommendation is for Europe. It's for Europe and its member states to stop launching new peace initiatives. I have high respect for the seniority of Ambassador Vimont and Ambassador Gentilini. But I think that experience demonstrates that those initiatives go nowhere, and that on the contrary, they simply provide both parties the Israeli government and the PA with convenient diversion from their respective political responsibility. Despite his reluctance to do so, the Israeli Prime Minister, and whether or not he, she will still be Netanyahu, will one day have to tell the Israelis whether he, she wants a big binational state or a smaller Jewish state, Jewish majority state, side by side with a Palestinian state. And Abu Mazen will also, or his successor, will also, hopefully, sometimes, eventually, provide the Palestinian people with a direction. We do not need new peace initiatives coming from Europe. But that is my fourth and last recommendation. Europe has another crucial, fundamental role to play in this region. And in this conflict in particular. Since a long time, the biggest aid donor 
to the Palestinians is the EU. And this is not sufficiently said and known in Europe. The EU should assert its ambition to be a soft power, which plays a constructive, effective, effective role in the conflict. And that role is based around the world cooperation. There will never be too much cooperation that the European Union, its member states, its civil society will develop with both Israel and Palestine on the economic front. And I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about energy, I'm talking about digital, I'm talking about pharmaceutical, I'm talking about agriculture, I'm talking about water, and there are many other subjects like that. Economic front, environmental front, it was alluded at this morning, educational front, and cultural front. And from that perspective, I do hope that more and more policymakers and opinion leaders in Europe will recognize eventually that activist groups such as BDS, which promote the infamous boycott of Israeli products, of Israeli academics, of Israeli artists, this is evil. Those groups act against the very interests of all parties involved in Israel, in Palestine, and in Europe. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. I mean, a number of those words have been uh, deliberately provocative, and it's because we have a, a great panel uh, to discuss uh, this and, and other issues this afternoon. Um, let, me, let me introduce all of them to you. We have Dr. Yossi Beilin, my old friend Yossi Beilin, who's a former Minister of Justice in Israel, and also one of the architects uh, of the Oslo uh, process who worked with Rabin, who worked with Perez, uh, and whom we are very happy to, to welcome this afternoon. Welcome, Yossi. We have also uh, two uh, senior uh, European representatives, uh, Ambassador Fer Fernando Gentilini, who is the EU Special Representative for the Middle East process. Welcome to you. And Ambassador Pierre Vimont, who's the special envoy for the French initiative for a Middle East peace conference. Welcome, sir. So I'll give the floor to uh, Yossi Bailin first for 15 minutes max. Please.